Um, that's why you want to get in with some good brokers. You know, I even have banks calling me directly now. So you definitely want to find a good broker and you want to make sure that you know they're working for you and you're on their A list. And you know, how do you get on their A list? Well, you know, fight to get on their A list. Was there a question over here? I, I, w I Listen, it seems like you're sort of a selling broker, but how yeah. do you know that your interest is being served when you are not, when you are working with a broker that is working for yourself? Yeah, m well, most likely it, it is a seller's broker's market, which means if you want to bring your own personal representative broker to the deal, you're actually going to have to pay <coughs> to do that. In the past, both sides got paid. But the banks are getting, they're just fed up and they're saying we're only paying one side. The seller is getting to get paid. If you want to bring a, bro a buyer broker to the deal, a buyer representative, then you have to pay them. It's really how you negotiate. Uh, the last building that I bought, um, I paid a buyer's broker fee. I paid my broker. And his, his argument to me was, well, Alan, if I didn't call you and if you weren't on my A list, you wouldn't have this deal at all. So it's not a deal that was listed with them? Correct. It was listed with somebody else. Mm -hmm. How did they know about it? Well, that's the broker world. You know, they're, they're all, you know. So how, how many brokers this do you need to have to be able to get to I have three. Okay. I have three. And believe me, and, and I owned a brokerage business for more than a decade in a different kind of product. Um, these guys are clawing, fighting, and they get very jealous and very upset when one gets paid and the other two don't. And I showed you first, and we have a, I mean, we are very careful when we approach doing a deal right now to make sure we really know who brought it to us first. Because I have, you know, maybe one broker bought me something in January at $10,000 a door, and he doesn't stay on top of the deal. And then another broker brings me something at $4,300 a door. Same, same product. Six months later, new price. Well, here's my new answer to that problem. It's not the same thing. If the price is that different, because I just went through it. I just maybe I just lost a, a relationship I've had for three to five years with somebody. He showed me something in January at around ten thousand dollars a door. We forgot all about it. Six months later, someone shows me it at half the price, a different broker. So he finds out I'm buying and he calls me up and he feels like I did something wrong. I guess it could be argued both ways, but well, then he's so bottom line is I'm not going to be his next first phone call. Right. What's the stat? What's the period that they they say you know? There's no there. This is this is all handshake and a little trust and lo, you know giving. You know you you're not going to sign anything. Don't you know don't sign anything. So you're they're not expect you're not expected to sign a, a, an agreement that you're only going to buy from them. No. I mean, th those days, they'd be in single-family houses, but those days are over. So the pizza's here? Yeah. Okay. So um, I got hungry people, I guess. Hungry? Okay. All right. So we'll, but we'll keep going. Can we eat and keep going at the same time? Yes. Uh, should we do in system? Okay. Go, 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 go. <laughs> We're about to start if you're outside. Captured equity. Captured equity. Does anyone out there want to cash your equity? Yeah. All right, all right. So, captured equity really does supercharge your cash flow. And if you, everyone can remember the example I had this morning, which was if you're going to undercut your competition, you really got to control the debt per door, which is basically finding an apartment building at the right price. Keep your debt per door as low as possible, much lower than your competition. 
What did your competition pay? It won't be that hard to figure out. Through appraisal reports out there, um, even when you're going through the process, you might see uh, five or ten apartment buildings that were just appraised in your appraisal for market comps. Um, when you capture that equity and you find that great deal, it really does attract money partners like you wouldn't believe it. My last time around, um, like, like six to eight weeks ago, I, I had to shut the subscription. I had to shut it off. I couldn't take any more money. I was full because the deal was so good. It sold itself. So um, when you capture all that equity, tracks private money, partners, and makes it easier to borrow money from lenders. The more you steal the deal, the easier it is to find the lenders. The more you steal the deal, the easier it is to find the lenders. Monday at 2.45, I'm driving to an area of Houston with that life insurance company. Um, they're very interested because we're buying it 30 cents in the dollar. He's still going to make me put down my 20 to 30 percent, whatever deal we strike. So they'll be in it for like 15 percent loan to value. They're all over that. 15, I mean, that's ridiculous. We find distressed properties sometimes. We find distressed properties that aren't stabilized and they're not performing. And yes, they are a little challenging to, to find underwriters, to find lenders that will lend money on a building that's not performing. But there's something called as-is loans. And I'll give you an example. And it comes from what I call my treasure chest play. If everyone read it in my course, basically treasure chest play is like that box that nobody wants. It's dirty, it's corroded, and you know you open it up and bang, you've got your gold, silver, diamonds, and you got your equity, and you got that building that might actually change the rest of your life. Treasure chest play. So this is actually a good time to do this. This is a case study that we'll go through quickly. Um, I bought this one for $300,000, a 52-unit building on 45 and Broadway. It's not even two blocks away from the exit. Sits across the street from a U.S. post office, has bus stops on both sides of the property, and there's a medical clinic across the street as well. $300,000. I took this closing statement, and less than a week later, walked down to a local bank, not even a mile from that building, and they lent $525,000 on it because they knew they knew the land was worth a lot more than everything that I wanted to do. So the as-is appraisal in this 52-unit building that wasn't functioning, that was destroyed, was a million one thirty. So they're in pretty good shape, and so am I. Got my 300000 cash out and 225000 on a rehab. Spent more on the rehab, but the point is that I got my money out at that time. So this is called Mansart. I don't know if anyone, everyone's familiar with it. I guess it was popular in the 50s and the 60s. I, to me, it looks like a roof on the side of the building. So we got rid of that junk. And so what happens? When you're out looking for properties and you see these red stickers, just be concerned, those red stickers. Don't, don't walk away from it. I mean, that means this, the city's on to the building, which is probably a good thing anyway. And if you want to go down and speak to someone in the city, I, maybe that's the health department. I'm not sure what, where that sticker came from. But it'd be a good idea to find out why the city's upset with the owner. And that will help you create your budget and negotiate. Every single door had these stickers on them. And you're not allowed to take them off. It's against the law. It's the parking lot. This was hurt, hit by Hurricane Ike. And so there was some mold issues, and we just had to get rid of everything. Can you explain why No. I'm trying to mix it up. But this one actually had an arson. <laughs> See, now you're all here. I can tell you the real ugly. 
a few weeks into buying this thing, someone said set it on fire. You know, but it was actually um, I didn't budget in for trash removal in my budget, which turns out to be very expensive. It's like four to five hundred dollars a dumpster. And I had some serious, I mean, like ten or twenty thousand dollars more in, in those expenses. So anyway, they kind of did me a favor, but ultimately, and when you do this, and we're going to do it together, we're going to do it right, you're going to have the right insurance. And I really never met anyone who didn't come out ahead in this kind of situation. Um, this was a hundred thousand dollar claim on something that I didn't really get to yet. So it. You know, there's the good and the bad. You know, it stinks that there was an arson fire, but we were well compensated for our time and our effort, and we needed to fix it anyway. So, you know, you're probably going to hire a general contractor. I, I kind of did, but I, 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 I showed up. I wanted to see what was going on because this was one of my first big jobs. And, you know, I thought I just needed a new roof, but what it really needed was new joists. I don't know if everybody knows what that is, but that's kind of the wood that keeps up the roof. So I had this contractor who had this bright idea that he was going to do the demolition first, the demolition work first, and he literally opened up all my roofs in the middle of January two or three years ago when it actually rained in Houston. Destroyed all my sheetrock. All my sheetrock. There it is, part of it. Coming along. My son. Some of us will get to know each other better, um, and we'll go out to my properties, and you know, we just use the same formulas. This, we actually just started buying this by the container for uh, 56 cents a square foot. And you know, our labor, we're putting it down for like 20, I mean, a dollar a square foot for beautiful flooring. It's working out great. And without sounding too um, cold hearted or generic, I'm trying to create apartment units where you just literally spray it down when you, when you get rid of the people or when they skip or leave or bust up the place. So that's great for turns. Saves you so much money. No more 12, 1,000 to $1,500 in carpet. This stuff has been going for a very long time. And more importantly, it's laid down in these three-foot planks. And if someone scratches it up or does something to it, just rip up one piece, put a new piece in, and you're done. What is it? Is that a wood? It's, it's a laminate, laminate flooring. It's laminate flooring. Where did you find it at Top Shelf? The kind I've been getting from the grooves. You can't take vinyl. I know this is vinyl. Sorry. It's, it's vinyl. It looks, it, it actually almost looks real. It's vinyl, yeah, vinyl. Hmm? I'm not a big fan of ceramic. Um, it's more expensive. It takes a lot longer. It takes a lot longer, and the ground shifts, and that stuff cracks. Mm -hmm. yeah. so um, Arm, Armstrong makes it. I found uh, another vendor two weeks ago that now buys it generic from Armstrong in containers. And interesting because I've committed to a container and he'll store it for me. It's great. They're great. Yeah, so, so I got a container there of, of this stuff and we're just using it as we need it with the understanding that he can borrow 10 or 20 percent of it for other customers. And he's doing that for me too. It's kind of a cool business model because I just borrowed from one of his customers. So yeah, very very popular, very popular popular with the Latino um, um, clientele we have. Uh, no more dust. Um, so just to kind of we're talking about this stuff. I mean, here's the way I do it: the 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 two tone color. I just pay a hundred. I pay a hundred and I think it was hundred and seventy five dollars a unit last time we did it for a one bedroom. That's it. I made a deal. Go do ten. Here's your seventeen fifty when you're done. So it's, I'm sorry, I'm talking about the, the walls now. But the floor is, is actually coming in less than $1,000 right now for um, one bedrooms. So, and you, you can't really see this here, but I wanted to share with you. It's called an epoxy spray. And they spray it on tile. 
and it really works well. So no more are we ripping down tile, going through that mess. Um, I can spray this for, I, I think uh, the backsplash in the bathtub is like $125. It looks great. I know it sounds nuts, painting bathtubs and countertops. But these guys get in there in their suits. It's lethal stuff. It sticks. It does a great job. They guarantee it. It looks brand new. And, yeah, you know, everyone does it. You can't even afford to try to think about building a new a new um, bathroom with tile. I don't know. Has anyone ever tried to take away tile? What a messy job. Really tough. Because it's a one-fifth of an inch in one bedroom? Yeah. Everything. Everything. These guys, it, it's, it's, it's an assembly line. I mean, it, it's just they're coming in with their, with their guns, and they got these, um, these edgers. I mean, this one took, a, uh, the one, um, just like one to three days or something for the whole process. So what, what we normally do is, am I talking about the rehab? No, we're going to start talking about financials. What I normally do is when I take on a rehab, okay, we trash out the place. And once we trash it out, like ripping out the carpet and ripping out, everything has to go. And we might do a, a clean on it. And then once we clean it up, um, we get in there with the white paint and we spray whatever, the, the ceilings and all that stuff. And then they get in there, and the same guys will do the walls. So I definitely like two-tone colors. And as soon as we're done doing that, um, you're going to have to give at least one day for the epoxy sprayers to get in because it's, it's lethal. You just can't be in there, and it might need a day or two to dry. So that's really it. Then it's just coming down to flooring. You know, there might be some more s serious things for like sheetrock and all that stuff. My painters are doing the sheetrock. As far as electrical and plumbing, th that's a conversation for another time. But I'm not really, I'm not really fixing plumbing, and I'm not really fixing electrical. Everything seems to work. It's just beaten up, just you know, little carpet tile and paint. So, would you like to see an example of what a rent roll looks like in, in my property management software? And I can run through some numbers with you, everyone. Okay, it's not the most exciting topic. When I see eyes dimming. I'm going to put uh, the Backstreet Boys back on for you. <laughs> okay. All right, give me a second here. They don't like Mozilla. Yeah. The property management software that I'm pulling up right now, it, it's www.diyres.com. And what I really like about it is I can log on from anywhere in the world and see what's going on with some of my properties. And I guess since we're talking about, I don't know, let's see what I can pull up here. Hang on. Yes. The website for the software is www.diydog. Do it yourself. R E S, real estate. No, no. DIYRES.com. 
I don't know. Let's look at Pearl. So we're looking at some real live numbers. We're not fully collected. Let's see how we stand. Um, I'm going to start with the rent roll. And I'm going to see if we can put one into XEDS so we can see it better. Hang on. Okay, so what's a rent roll? Rent roll is what your leasing agent or your property manager would use at your apartment building. And you know, basically it's, it's, it's the, the system of the apartment building so you can monitor it from anywhere in the world and it keeps track of all your money from a property management standpoint of view. Somebody comes in, rents a unit, it all goes through this DIYRES.com. I can see when uh, people are pre-leasing. I can see applications that are going out. I can see if people are paying on time. I can see if late fees are being paid. I can see who's getting a letter for an eviction. I can see who's in eviction. I can see how many units are rented. I can see how many units aren't rented. I can see how much money's been collected so far this month. I can see how much money should be collected so far this month. Everything. So. Um, we're not going to spend a lot of time. This is really another course. But so resident's name, hypertext into the resident's name. You get all their information. It's right there. Lease expiration, really cool. They have like a 12-month time chart. It'll say, hey, you know, let me know in October how many leases are up for expiration. So I can kind of, um, I can kind of make sure that, at least on my houses, the way I like that, if I have 100 leases on 100 houses and I see that 75 are up for, for a new lease in July, well, I'll tell the team to start renting houses for like 13 or 14 month leases and spread it out just so I kind of spread out my risk. So leases, terms, move-in dates, when are they vacating if they gave notice, what kind of security deposit, and they pay. Check comes in. The property manager you know, marks it off $500, and the register starts accumulating. Here's what I really like. OK, that's kind of the boring stuff. I like, I guess this is page five here. Let's see what we're on here. I'm sorry you guys can't, maybe can't see it. But this is a summary of the rent roll. And this is what I really care about. What is this telling me right now? It's telling me that I have 59 units online. It's telling me of the 59, 52 are occupied. I have six available and one vacant future lease is coming in. It's telling me that I have a few prepayments over here already for next month. It's showing me the name of the person who's moving in and what unit number. Now, what it's really showing me is, um, oh, this was not a very good example. but. OK, here's what I got going on right now. Net rentable income. I have $46,000 collected. Um, and I need to get to 56000 OK, that's what I really want to know. So I've got approximately $10,000 outstanding right now. What's today's date? Yeah, that's about right. So, and I also, uh, you know what, I'm going to go get one more example. There's, there's, there's something called, we spoke about this the other day, but I'll say it again, very important. Physical occupancy and economic occupancy. Physical occupancy is, is right, how many people physically live in your apartment units. You've got 100 units, 100 units are full. You're 100% physically occupied. Seems like those are the magic numbers everybody wants to always talk about. I'm not quite sure why. It's the economic numbers. Because I might have a building that's 100% full. I sure as hell don't have a building where 100% people are paying. So we care about economic occupancy. How many are paying? Um, you'll find maybe 10% don't pay. So just tell me about your economic collections when you're trying to sell me something. 
because you'll find when you're getting ready to buy an apartment complex, there's not a lot of evictions going on because of cost. And the guy's trying to probably pump up his numbers on physical occupancy. So again, I'll stress economic occupancy. Um, gross potential rents. How much can I, what's my best number? You know, if everything was full, I didn't give away anything, no more concessions, they came in on some kind of special deal, the 30, 60 days is up, um, I can collect gross, I could collect $80,000 a month. So it allows you to know where you are in your game and how to manage your property management company. This isn't a very good example because I have a building that's down that's going through a rehab, but I know that when that rehab is done and we bring those 12 units online, then that building will be collecting $80,000. You know, right now it's going to be collecting fifty-six thousand dollars, and I've only got. So my game really is I can't collect any more anything more than fifty-six thousand dollars. It's just the way it is. The good news is, I know when I start fixing my problems how much money we can make. Gross potential rent. I'm just going to pull up my house, my house is uh, for a second because I know a lot of people out here have single family houses and this is unbelievable. You wouldn't think about using this kind of software for single family houses, but it's great training for apartments. Because again, a lot of us don't know how well we can actually do. So once you start seeing those numbers and you see those gross potential rent numbers and you see the physical occupancy and the economic occupancy and you see when people are paying, it, it just becomes so much realer instead of just, you know, putting everything in a shoebox. Um, what's going on right now? PDF and then I'll give you a quick synopsis. Eleven pages. Okay, currently I have 101 units online. 93 are occupied and two future leases. So 95, yeah, sounds about right. Um, MTM, month to month. I have 42 people that don't have current leases. I should do something about that. So that's letting me know that. Uh, my physical occupancy is 92%. My economic occupancy is 91%. The way we're running it with all our specials this month, the best I can do right now is collect $83,000 in change. Um, but since I have some vacancy and I have some specials going on, the best I can do this month is collect around uh, $76,000. So it's letting me know right there, I got to get rid of my specials and I got to fill this thing up and I got to stop giving away a week or two free rent or something like that. So I can work on closing that gap, but I really got to focus on the gap of what's collected, net rentable receipts. I've collected $62,000 and I need to get to 76, difference of $14,000 and change. Um, that's about right. That's about right. What this doesn't reflect for me, which kind of helps, is deposits when people move in. So that's just the way I run my business, doesn't it? Um, so it's just those few numbers. It's just those, if, if you know, I mean, I know now, so I got all these people working for me, and I know they've collected $62,000 on my houses, and they should get to 76. Where's the $14,000? Where's my $14,000? And um, it's really quick just to figure it out, and you know who to call. Um, another cool thing about this software that I really like is you get all these kind of reports. 
and then we're going to move on quick because I see some eyes going. My property management company really likes this kind of software. They use it for all financials. They book everything. Every check goes through this system. So you get all the accounting software, all the budgeting, all the banking. Um, it has that utility um, uh, bill processing uh, service. So when you start rubbing back your expenses, they call it rubs. Rubbing back the expenses to the tenants on the, on the gas and the electric, and you come up with all the formulas. It's all built in there. Um, when you create your own property management business, you can give yourself a 3 to 6% fee, and it's all, you know, you can use this software to help you build your property management business like my property manager is doing right now. Um, no. This I pay... I think I pay like 35 cents a door each month. So I don't know, there's probably whatever, six or 700 doors in this particular software right now. So that's what we pay, which is very inexpensive compared to some other, proper, uh, other software programs out there. Um, so you got the rent rolls, delinquencies. I like the vacancy too. Uh, let's take a look what's going on over at Oak Point. This is sometimes what I do, I'll do a drive-by, I'll show up at the apartment building unannounced. You always want to show up unannounced. And they keep this stuff up on boards, but it's nice to see electronic. And I know exactly what's going on. I can see unit 103, 108, 135, 141. So Take a look at this. Anyway, now that we're let's take a look at the rent roll quick and see how they're doing. I spent the last few days getting ready for today and didn't really pay attention to this. Do you see by using this kind of software how easy it is to implement these systems and let somebody run it? And all you got to do is really check just a few minutes a day. Second down. PDF. Wow. Oops. There it is. Oop. Okay. We'll do one more of these. So this is the rent roll for a 162-unit building. 147 are occupied, seven are available, eight have been leased. They had a problem over there. We got this construction going on in front of the building where they literally they sh they they locked us off one entrance, and nobody wants to go down the street. So we had a leasing problem. So we had a little back-to-school party a few weeks ago. So they, they really came back strong. They ended one, two, three, four. How many future leases? Eight. Eight. Fu I mean, that, that's really good because it was that much worse. Um, so they're at ninety-one percent. I mean, the average for C-class buildings are approximately anywhere between eighty and eighty-five percent. So these guys are at ninety-one percent. And again, when you're when you're doing the 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 buildings, the apartment buildings. You work this into your whole year budget. Like, we're right on. He bought himself, the property manager said, look, you know, let's do this at model at 85%. We'll have 15% vacancy the whole time. And this is what you're going to make. And every month, I hope we get to the, every month he sends me seven things. <coughs> and we compare those numbers. And it takes five minutes. Adam? Yes. Well, first of all, you don't empty out the bank account. I know maybe you've, you've, you've got to always have operations money. There's always money coming in and money going out. 
maybe maybe two or three months were really good and two or three months are not so good. So we're not running the we're not running the break even number just to figure out how much penny we can extract from the project. Um, we're always leaving padding in there to run the business. Um, I'd never had a problem with this building, but there's people definitely have problems cash flowing their properties. Um, if you're asking, I, I wouldn't know off the top of my head what my break-even number is on this 162-unit building, but at 85 percent, I'm sorry, so at 91 percent, we're doing really well with this one. I, I know, I know that. Like, like we return 15 percent to our investors just about every month, and I say about just about every month because there's there's always some bills that are coming in late. You know, I don't know if you're familiar with cash accrual and cash basis. And um, you never want to run your bank account with nothing in it. So does that answer that question? Don't pull out all the money. I know, but I. I I agree. Then don't th don't buy that particular building. Right. Yeah. I mean, you want to buy it as low as possible. Now, I think uh, to me, uh, a lot of other things are scary, like like Wall Street and 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 but job security. I didn't say eighty. Wait, wait. I didn't say eighty percent to you for anything. What, what are you referring to when you say eighty percent? The debt well, maybe that was just a bank looking at a DCR. Um, that didn't necessarily mean that's what I was. That wasn't my numbers. That's what a bank was looking for. No, I think okay. I think I understand what's happening now. The the. The national average, or definitely the average in the city, is let's just say it's 83% occupancy, physical occupancy. I didn't say anything about making money, or I mean, the, all these buildings in C-class uh, apartment buildings are 83% full. Average. average. Thank you. Average. That's it. They didn't say anything about money. But you can still Hang make on. money at 83%. Absolutely. Occupancy. Absolutely. Because the pricing that you were talking about. You, you're kind of throwing me. Al, this morning you, you made a comment, and I think it was just in general. It wasn't an apartment building, it wasn't 80 percent. But earlier this morning you made a comment about saying, when I look at my deal, I'm, I'm leasing at certain points. And one way of looking at it is saying that you know, up to 70 percent, that's what pays, that's what break even is. Oh, oh, I got gotcha. you. It's where I make my profit. I think that's what you're okay. I didn't. I, I kind of just threw that out there. I didn't mean it. I just kind of meant that the last week of the month, when I see all this money that's uncollected, it's my money, and that's when I get a little more active on my on my team. Um, I didn't mean that to say that that it, there was only ten or twenty percent money to be made. Period. There's a lot more money to be made. It's just that you know it, it, that last seven days of the month. I'm going to not get any of it if people don't get off their ass and go collect it. <laughs> Help. <laughs> Sorry. All right. Okay. But th you do got to watch those numbers. You're right. I mean, it could be 70% it could be break even for somebody. So, but th that would still be a very, very healthy margin. And y you're taking a lot more risks in your life, and you don't even know it. Um, so let's just see how this is performing, okay? They've collected $53,000 in change. They need to get to 60, so they have $7,000 in change outstanding. So I know for the next 10 days, I'm going to make, I'm going to stay on them and see if they, they got to get that $7,000. Um, miscellaneous charges, folks, miscellaneous charges. 
Could be, could be from charging for reserved parking. I love a building that has half of it covered and half of it non-covered, because then I can charge for covered parking. Because I have one building where it's all covered. I can't charge. <laughs> yeah. So I got the, they got parking fees in there, um, vending machine fees in there. Um, okay, so th that's really the rent roll. I'm not going to spend too much time on the software right now. Does anyone have any questions? Okay. Oh, sorry. It's online. It's actually the stuff that I use in my, within my property management companies, and it's really stuff that we've compiled over the years, how we run the organization. So there's a manual online for you. Oh, okay. Okay. It was one of those. It was one of those long bonuses that my wife had told me about. I was giving away. Um, yes. Um, some current slides. Okay. What? Well, I thought about it. I'm actually, I'm, I'm thinking about creating something. But this is just so, it's so easy to use. It's just, um, people do that as they get bigger. They create their own proprietary software. But this is like, I mean, 35 cents a door times 100 units, uh, $35? Uh, you know? Yeah, and, and it's online. And I don't have to deal with any servers and stuff like that. Refinancing game. So trillions of dollars needs to be refinanced over the coming years in the apartment and housing business. The sad fact is most of oh, the sad fact is much of it won't be. I've seen buildings not only stripped away of its core assets such as copper wire by scrappers, but also the equity that appreciated sometimes over 50 years. This is going to lead to a huge opportunity and massive wealth transfer to real estate apartment entrepreneurs. That's exactly what we're doing. We spoke about maybe you know we spoke about how and why prices got so high how easy it was to borrow money, and what a huge opportunity right now. You can take money from this side of the room and just move it to this side of the room. And then you guys run your apartment buildings the way I'm running my apartment buildings. We run them right, and you'll be set, and you'll never have to move it back to that side of the room. The question is, have I seen a bank do a loan modification or a short sale so it doesn't go to foreclosure? In the apartment business. Yeah, I guess it's a short sale. So I've seen banks work with owners through hard times. I haven't seen too many generous banks modify an apartment loan. Haven't. Well, <laughs> if, it, if it's a if it's a lose lose situation, I've seen them go all the way. But if you know if you're working with the bank, I would suggest if anyone has a problem with the bank, tell them the truth. And then you know who better to run your deal than you? You know, let them know who you're working with. And I and I've seen that work great, totally. I mean, I, I've seen five, ten, fifteen million dollar deals, three of them in the last twelve months, where the banks wanted their money back, and the owner didn't have the financing lined up in time because those kind of decisions right now in this kind of marketplace take time for boards to agree on. And open communication and everything worked out. They don't want it back because quite frankly, they're going to take a 10 to 30% haircut at least, not to mention the repercussions. In housing. Yeah, okay. In housing. They're, they're so, they are, actually, and, and, and I've said it before. I mean, but when a bank gets one of these back on their books, look out. They don't want to keep it. I mean, we're all good. They're used to keeping houses right now. It's status quo. I mean, it's... Do they, do they just put whoever there, or do they well, keep For example, the last one that I just bought, the uh, U.S. Bank Corp., they said, we're not in this business. Take a month on me or two months and get out. Um, and they boarded up the whole entire property 
Matter of fact, every inch of the boards had screws in them, like to the to to, to the the letter of the law. It was unbelievable. So some banks want to run them, some banks don't. Some banks will hire a receiver. The receiver is probably going to be a property management company, and they will run that deal. So they keep the tenants, and they try to sell it to um, they try to sell it while it's full, try to get as much money as possible, and also to protect the property from vandalism. So, so we spoke about the refinance um, opportunities that are going on right now. Um, we were talking about some taxes during lunchtime, so I came up with this 80% rule that doesn't matter what you buy a property at. I found over the last five years that you can steal the deal and you can convince the, uh, the taxing authorities what you really paid, but two or three years later, before you know it, you're going to be paying 80% to HCAD value. So keep that in mind when you're working on your future projections. And I'll, I'll tell this story quick. The last, the last deal that I bought, 24 hours before we signed off and paid, the taxing rate went down from, I, I want to say, 3.2 million to 1.1 million. And the seller didn't figure it out. And neither did the title company. And that was, I got credited that amount percentage-wise, let's just say 50,000 to make it easy, for the first six months at a $3.2 million tax base. It's awesome. So moral, I'm sharing it with you, is to make sure you check what that property is being taxed at the day before you go to closing. It just happened to me. Could have been the other way around. That would have been a big problem. I threw this in here, too. I'm finding in C-class apartment buildings that approximately uh, your expenses are going to be around $4,000 a door to run it. And I think we already sp talked about when you're talking about all bills paid properties, I would add in 100 to $150 a door on your expenses because you're paying the electricity. I realize that you might be collecting that money, but you still have to account that to be an expense. When you're running your numbers on a deal that you want to buy, I know what it's like to feel, you know, that feeling like I have to have this. This is going to make the biggest change in my life. And I'm going to force this deal and I'm going to make it happen. I don't want you to ever go over 82% when it comes to um, calculating your numbers based off of collections. If someone tells you you're going to collect $40,000 a month on this property, just take 82% of that. Because what you're going to see is 10% vacancy if you run it well. at 90, That will be 90%. And there's always skipping and there's always problems. There's always skipping and there's always problems. If you know the answer to this question, don't ask, answer it. But if you do, please raise your hand. What percentage of turnover do you think I have on average in my incredible, beautiful apartment building? No. <laughs> do you own a building? <laughs> okay, you're a good candidate, Sam. Who else? Ninety percent. What? Oh, that would, I'd be creamed. Ninety percent. I should go into the hotel business. Ten. Okay. Okay. Unfortunately, Sam is correct. Fifty to sixty percent of the people move out after a 12-month lease in the, in the apartment business that I'm experienced in. I think that's the case as well in Class A because a lot of those people are moving into houses. 50 to 60 percent. So you really want to create an apartment unit that is ready to turn over quickly and won't cost you a lot of money get up and running. Hi. Yes. You're making $100 a door. Yeah. It's all factored in. That's $1,200. Oh, okay. You think that I'm hoping to move out this time? Yes. Yes.
I've slowed down on the eviction process because I found that these little lockout devices are working pretty good. Um, I don't know if anyone's ever seen them, but they're, they're metal. And you just kind of put them on top of someone's doorknob to get into their, their door, to get into their unit, and they can't get their key in there. So you've locked them out. There's laws and rules you've got to apply by and get over there, for, I think, like within 24 hours or something. Um, then we charge them some fees if we have to go in there late at night or something. And once they find that out, they don't call anyway until the next day when the office is open. I've started fighting back over the last 12 years with people that don't want to pay their rent. So I've saved a lot of money on not going to eviction court. I wouldn't go anyway. My property manager would go. But it costs $96 to file. We live in a great state for this business. I mean, we can have people out really qu damn quick, 30 to 45 days, carried out with their stuff if that's the case. Not to mention the apartment business. You can make their life pretty damn miserable if you had to. You just leave it at that. But we've had pretty hot summers, and those condensers always have to be serviced, right? So I don't see any reason why we don't service the paying customers first. go into that. So as far as the, the software, if anyone hasn't received emails from me or I think dodeals.com about passwords and logins, send me an email and I'll see that it gets taken care of over the next few days. Okay? This is really good software. Um, I don't want to go into it right now. It's, it's kind of complicated. Danielle does a great job explaining this. He's got five uh, YouTube videos on how to use it. It's fantastic. I have stuff that I use. I'll share it with everybody here. This is state of the art. Um, I also have software. It's really another course. But um, I, really, I help people figure out the whole financial plan from how many units do you need to buy, how much do you need to live on. I mean, just down to the, down to the unit. Some people say down to the penny. For me, it's down to the unit. When to walk away. The most profitable apartment buildings are the ones that I didn't buy. Uh, Malago's story. I was going to buy something. It was quite expensive. It was probably like a four or five million dollar building. And at the end of the day, I got up on the roof. And before I got up on the roof, I was very excited because this was the one. This was, I think it was like 375 units. The financing, the owner was going to leave it there for a few years. And I had enough partners and funding. I had everything lined up. And I walked every single unit with a team. And then I got up on the roof, and you know there's just squishy stuff going on. And I'm just walking on the roof, and it's like I'm sinking on the roof. So, and the roof at that time to me was looking bigger than a football field. So I'm thinking, oh my God, how much would it cost? There's this rule in the business that a general rule that to rehab a roof costs fifteen hundred dollars a unit. So I'm thinking, just say 400 units. I'm saying, oh my God, six, the first $600,000 has to go to the roof. Well, how's that going to make what, anybody want to move into this apartment complex, right? They can't see where I just spent $600,000. I want to, I want to set, you know, spend it on the exterior and paint this place and maybe new refrigerators and stuff like that. So not only was the roof really squishy, which meant the joist was underneath was a problem, um, the condensers. It was, it was very intimidating. Every single condenser looked like, I don't know, uh, you guys remember, remember Popeye? And he had a few hairs standing up. I mean, they all had wires popping out of them. And I, I looked at the maintenance guy, and I'm like, how do you do this? And he's like, we don't come up here when it rains. We get shocked. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, what do you, I mean, August? I mean, well, it doesn't rain here right now, but uh, so, I mean, so, and then I'm thinking condensers are going to cost me around 500 and, and before I knew it, I was up to like three quarters of a million dollars just on the roof. So I, you know, I had to walk away from the deal. I, I wanted it so bad. I mean, I was. No, nope, because it was being owner financed. Since it was being owner financed, they were kind of taking advantage of the situation. They were trying to make something attractive for me, but their rule was, we're not going to write down our note and lose money for you. We'll just let you run the deal. And I, I think we all know that when things are being owner-financed, they're being owner-financed usually for a reason, to 
because the owner doesn't really want to lose money, right? That's why I'm so down on single-family houses when I hear about all the owner finance stories. So we're owner financing houses to people that can't afford them in the first place. So you guys, it's like lose-lose on both sides. So I'm going to have to get this to you folks. It, it's just a pro forma. It, it's, it's literally like 10 numbers you just put in. It's an it's a Excel program. And send me an email. I, if it, I'll try to get it up on the website. And this is kind of what I use before I really take my negotiations serious, just to see where the cap rate comes up, just to see where, I mean, you just put the units in here, two bedroom, one bath. Um, you find out what they're renting for. So all those numbers add up for you. And um, you know, you'll get your gross potential schedule of rents. And this year, your expenses per unit, your administration, your payroll, repairs, maintenance, you'll get all this information from the seller, and you've got to just plug in the numbers. I'm not saying that information is going to be right, but you're going to get numbers. And then there's industri industry statistics that we can compare this to to make sure that they're real. Um, okay, yeah, but it would just take way too much time to, to open that spreadsheet up. I need everyone to get alive here. So I can't do everything today. I can't do everything today. It's just impossible. And I'm just trying to make everybody feel comfortable with this program. I don't want anyone to feel intimidated. It's a process. It's absolutely a process. But if you want to make money in the real estate, this is the only way I know to make money right now in apartment buildings. Maybe in five years it's single family houses again. Maybe in 10 years. But the old formulas are not working. I'll say it again, I'm an expert, I own 102 houses. Matter of fact, I'll make a challenge to anyone here. I'll take, I'll take a $75,000 house that comes in, appraisal, 75,000, I'll sell it for $50,000 to anybody, as long as a bank lends on it. <laughs> but that's, why are we laughing at that? I'll do that challenge, actually. I, maybe I'll like, we'll record it on the internet or something. I, fine, I'll, I'll probably make $5,000, like a flip fee or something. If any, I mean, okay, so that's why I'm excited about apartment buildings, because I see transactions happening and I see people making money. So I have this two-day apartment investing transformation event. And this is, th this is just the beginning. This is just the beginning. There's other clubs in town. Um, this is just the beginning of my club. I have 60 people in it right now. That's okay. This is for this group anyway. So um, what are we going to go into? You have a lot of this information, so I don't want you to think anything's incomplete. But it's just going to be a lot easier when we do it in the same working environment together. So in this seminar that I have coming up, we're going to go more into how to find deals you need to meet your financial freedoms goals. And we're going to go into working with property management companies, you know, what to expect, and even go work with them. Even go work. Some of my students actually go into my apartment buildings to learn the business. Um, I'm going to teach you how to manage your managers and, you know, get these reports from them once a month. You know, here's what I get. I get a narrative on every single building. I get an annual budget, and we just compare month to month and maybe month to month from last year to make sure